Now we go on to the next example. A cannon launches a cannonball at an angle of 40 degrees above the horizontal with an initial velocity of 200 meters per second. A. Determine the range of the cannonball. B. Determine the maximum height attained by the cannonball. Assume the height of the cannon above the ground is negligible. So here's the picture. I have this cannonball which is going to be launched essentially even with ground level. And we're going to make the assumption that the cannonball is going to hit the ground at the same level that it launches and we don't have to worry about the curvature of the earth. Here's a preview of coming attractions. If we do have to worry about the curvature of the earth, then generally we're going to be talking about a satellite or some object that's going to be traveling over a very long distance like a ballistic missile. In these sorts of problems, we're not going to take that into account. The cannonball follows a parabolic path. In part A, we're trying to find the range of the cannonball, the distance from the launch point to the place where it's going to hit the ground. In part B, we're going to try to find what is the maximum height of the cannonball, which happens at that point up there. We call that point the apex of the flight. And so we're trying to find what this height is right there. As usual with these problems, let's begin with a list of variables, a horizontal list and a vertical list. I usually start with an origin, and the origin is going to be where the action begins, which over here is going to be at that point right there. And I'm going to call the initial position in the x direction 0 and the initial position in the y direction 0, corresponding with that point in space. Now I have an initial velocity which is not completely horizontal, nor is it completely vertical, but it's at some angle. And so I have an initial velocity triangle that has a V0x that's horizontal and a V0y that's vertical. I know the hypotenuse of this triangle is 200 meters per second. I also know that it makes an angle of 40 degrees. So I can figure out the initial velocity in the horizontal direction and the initial velocity in the vertical direction. They're related to the sine and the cosine. And with your permission, I'll put in 200 for v naught, multiply each by the appropriate trig function, and come up with numbers. And so the initial velocity triangle has a horizontal component that is 153.2 meters per second, and the y component of that initial velocity triangle is 128.6 meters per second. I'm going to add those numbers to my horizontal and vertical list. I can also say that the acceleration in the x direction is zero because the only force, unbalanced force acting is weight. The acceleration in the y direction is going to be determined by the sign of it by the fact that I have called the initial velocity in the y direction positive. So I have implied in writing that down as a positive number that up is positive. So ay has got to be negative 10. One more thing I can write is that right before the point of impact over at the range that the object will be at the same vertical level as it left, which is y equals 0 right before impact. Now, I'm trying to figure out in part A what this distance is between the launch point and the end point. In other words, if my origin is over here on this side and I call this x naught is equal to 0, I'm trying to figure out what is x over here on the right. If I could figure out the amount of time that the object's in the air, then I could figure out what x is from the second equation of motion. Let me write that down horizontally. In this equation of motion, the initial position is zero, and the horizontal acceleration is also zero. Some things disappear. So if I could get a number for time, then I could get a number for the range, x. How can I figure out the time? Well, I can figure out the time from the second y equation of motion. There are several things that are equal to zero in this equation. One thing is that when the object, right before the object hits the ground, its vertical position is going to be zero. Its initial position is also zero, and so I can put those zeros in, and when I do, I'm going to have an equation that I can factor time out of. So let me factor that common factor of t out and write the equation again. And now what I claim is that this equation that I just wrote down will be true if either one of the things that are multiplying the other are equal to zero. In other words, 
t is going to be equal to 0, or v naught y plus 1 half a y t has got to be equal to 0. Well, t equals 0 is not very interesting to me, because what that would say is that the object is at the origin when it's at ground level. I know that. That's where the action begins, at time 0. What is more interesting to me, though, is this other part. Let me solve that equation for t. And now let me put in the numbers. And now let me figure out what t is. Notice that the negative sign upstairs and the negative sign in the acceleration downstairs are going to cancel each other out. This tells me that the projectile is going to be at ground level again in just over 25 seconds, 25.71 seconds. Big deal. So what? The so what is, now I've got a number I can put into the x equation for time and also add that to the initial velocity in the x direction, and I can figure out what the range is. Let me do that. And I get that the range is nearly 4 kilometers, 3939 meters. That solves part A of this problem. Now we need to go back and figure out part B. And I want to go back up to our diagram up here for part B and notice some things. Part B says we want to determine the maximum height attained by the cannonball. In other words, if y is equal to 0 down here, then what is y max up here at the top? Now let's look at what's going on with the velocity as this object travels along its parabolic path. The velocity does not change horizontally. The x component is always going to be 153 meters per second. But vertically, the object is going to slow down until up at the apex, it is going for an instant to come to a stop. And we're going to use that fact that at the apex, the y component of the velocity is zero to help us solve this problem. Here's a very important point. The object is still moving. It's moving horizontally, but it's not moving vertically at the instant that it gets to the apex. So overall, the velocity slows down until at the apex, it's, a, it's its minimum point. At that minimum point, it's 153.2 meters per second, whatever it's moving horizontally. And then it begins to pick up speed again, and then it's going to hit the ground over on the other side. But at that instant in time when it gets to the apex, vertically, it is not moving. Vertically, its y component of velocity is zero. So let me use that along with the other information I know in the y direction in order to solve for what y is. We're going to use the third equation of motion. I can feed in some zeros at this point. At the apex, vy is zero. At the origin, the initial position vertically is zero. So let me feed those numbers in. And now I know all the other numbers in this equation. Let me solve that equation for y. And now let me feed in the numbers. Notice again that this negative sign upstairs and the negative sign downstairs conveniently cancel each other out. And now I'll put in my calculator and see what I get. I get 826.4 meters is the maximum position. How high the highest point above the ground that the object goes.